A very warm welcome to everybody today and to the first of our debates for the academic year 2018 to 19. And we're delighted to be starting out on our second year of these debates now, which were really warmly received last year. As always, we're thankful to TES and colleagues at TES for their support for the series. Now, we covered a lot of ground last year from social mobility to vocational education, AI and neuroscience. But there are loads more big issues in education and we're eager to get going on them too. Before we do, there are the usual housekeeping announcements to make. As you arrived in the Jeffrey Hall, you'll have seen posters showing the Wi-Fi login instructions. For tweeters among you, the hashtag is hash IOE debates or one word, and we get really great discussion going on Twitter. That's also the way that our live stream audience can put questions to the panel. And we're not expecting a fire drill, so if the alarm sounds, we'll take the doors behind you out onto Bedford Way, and anyone who can't use the stairs should move to the doors on the audience's left, and a fire marshal will assist you out. So, now we can make a start. Now, judging by the news headlines, perhaps the biggest issue facing our education system and young people at the moment is mental health and well-being. Childhood, and especially the teenage years, have long been times of challenge as we move to more independence and grapple with new feelings and new pressures. But young people today seem to be struggling much more. Now, are we just more open about these struggles today? Or are there stronger and new pressures facing young people? Can we say what's causing the most damage in that case? And how well equipped or not have our schools and other institutions been in helping young people and their families in overcoming these difficulties? This evening, we've brought together a panel with research and practitioner expertise to talk us through these issues as they see them, and hopefully to offer us some guidance on how to protect young people from the worst threats to their happiness and to their sense of well-being. And before I introduce our speakers, can I please have a show of hands from you, the audience, how many of you feel that the pressures faced by young people today are significantly greater than those for their parents? Wow, okay, that is a lot of hands. But also, some hands didn't go up, so we should have a good debate today. Let me turn to our speakers then. So, Viv Grant is Director of Integrity Coaching. She's an executive coach, author, and public speaker who works primarily with school leaders to maintain their love of the profession. Her 30 years experience spent in the teaching and leadership realm of schools has been pulled together and applied to the issue of mental health in schools more generally. And as part of that work, Viv is a board member of the UK's first center of excellence for mental health in schools. Pravita Pathale is Associate Professor at UCL. She researches mental ill health, its development and consequences, and risk and protective factors. She's also interested in how we can reduce the stigma around mental illness. Her work spans the analysis of national data sets as well as evaluations of school-based interventions. And in 2017, Pravitha was included in the prestigious Forbes 30 under 30 list for the science and healthcare field. Caroline Hounsell is accredited British Association counselling psychotherapist and Director of Community Development at Mental Health First Aid England, having been one of their first instructors. She's been involved in the design and content of many of their courses. And one of Caroline's main projects at the moment is the rollout of mental health first aid uh, into secondary schools by 2020, into all secondary schools, I should say, by 2020, as part of the Prime Minister's Youth in Schools programme. 
And then Patrick Johnson is Director of Learning at Place to Be. Patrick's research background is in psychological medicine and psychiatry, and he's also worked at the Behaviour Genetics Clinic at the South London and Maudsley Hospital. Prior to joining Place to Be, Patrick was assistant head at Highgate School, where his responsibilities included the development of the school's pupil wellbeing and mental health strategy. So as you can see, we have a great expert panel, very well placed to help us answer our questions. And I turn without further ado to Caroline to kick us off. Caroline. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Okay, so I'm really looking forward to this debate and this discussion. I think uh, I've got a number of hats that I sit here with you today. One of my hats is uh, a psychotherapist. One of my hats is a director. One of my hats is uh, as, as a carer for a family member. Another one of the hats is somebody that's also experienced mental ill health issues. So um, I've got all these different hats uh, in, in front of you. And this, this topic area is, is something really important to me because in a way I was born into mental health. You know, mental health in, in my world was something that was a secret we didn't talk about. I remember um, we didn't learn about it at school. So it was something I was often very, very confused about. And uh, my mum was also, who experienced mental health issues, she was also a very successful businesswoman. So she had this, this, this sort of mask that she used to put on as she used to go out into the world. And then it used to come off as she came home at night. And um, I think, you know, I'm talking to you today about, you know, you know, what I think is going on. And I think what's going on is quite complex at the moment. Uh, young people are definitely <coughs> presenting younger. And there's definitely more people coming forward. So um, some of that <coughs> might be attributed to the fact that there's been some fantastic anti-stigma work and education work that's going on. Some of that would be maybe because actually there's more, more issues. Now, um, you know, I think on a base level, society is quite stressed. And um, I think we've got to ask ourselves some quite serious questions about why. Uh, in a nutshell, I think that the human brain is not designed to be living in the level and the speed and the complexity that we are living at the moment. I walked down the street here on my way to, to this conference and almost every person was engaged in their phone. All of this stuff is going on around you. Like it's, that's, that's in a way interesting for me because mindfulness is really successful at the moment, really popular. Because for me, in a way, it's a bit of an antidote to this, to this world where we're living in, where we can't switch off. So if you think about young people, you've got that, you know, they're going to school, if they're in school. Um, we know our teachers are stressed. You know, we know there's a lot of pressure we put on our teachers and the, the focus has been on academia. We know our parents and the caregivers at home <coughs> are quite stressed. And if you think about anxiety, it's very contagious, isn't it? So if I'm walking into a room and I'm feeling anxious, the likelihood is you're going to pick up on it. So it can really escalate. I think that, you know, on a basic level, I think uh, we kind of need a bit of a revolution when it comes to education. I think the education system is operating in, in, in very outdated ways. I think that needs to be updated. I think there's something about understanding different learning styles and properly teaching to those different learning styles. You know, my son is, is a very kinesthetic learner and he's also uh, somebody that experiences um, challenges at school and also with his, with his mental health as well, his anxiety around that. And, um, I mean, he used to talk at primary school about standing there uh, and sitting down and just li literally watching the, the smart board all day long. You know, so if you're, you're a very kind of kinesthetic learner and you like to get hands-on and get involved, you know, how difficult must it be that someone's constantly teaching you in a different learning style? So that's something that really particularly interests me <clears throat> I also think that, um, you know, I, I love things like the idea of forest school, where you get to learn about the world, maths, 
on, you know, by going outside and exploring your environment and changing the scene a little bit. And I think for some children, that's a little bit of a light bulb moment. Um, I like the idea of mental health being as important as physical health. So wherever we embed mental health, well, physical health across our structures and processes, what would it be like to put mental health in there? Um, so if you took it to the extreme, it would be things like, you know, we have PE, physical education. Well, imagine if we had mental education, you know, that respected and that normalised. So actually, maybe we could even have both, you know, physical and mental education because we're one and the same. We're connected by a neck that connects the mind and the body. And if you think about it, when you're feeling physically unwell, you're likely to be mentally unwell and vice versa. So, so we can't really separate those two. I think the idea of, of involving young people is really important. Um, and often, all, you know, things are discussed, but uh, they're often we don't involve young people. And I think we underestimate young people. So I think... I love the idea of having sort of well-being, holistic mental health and physical health groups that involve young people where they're driving the agenda forward in their particular school. I think we need to think more like a team. That's another mm -hmm. thing, because often we work in silos. We don't often work very well together. If you think about a typical school, for example, there, you know, my experience of working in a school um, is that they're that little institutions in a way, and um, they're very much driven by the leadership of the school. And, um, and actually, I think it's really important to engage in businesses and, and organisations around that to keep it fresh. Um, I think the idea of having peer helpers, if you think about mental health, if you have um, young people who have been through mental health issues themselves, if they are leading the way and going into school and inspiring young people about mental health, I think that's works so powerfully. And I think people like you know, the super champions at Time to Change are fantastic because they go out there and you know, they spread the word of positivity. And, and actually, they're more on the same wavelength as the young people themselves. I think the idea, you know, having a sort of simple thing like a, a mental health policy, I mean, lots of schools still don't have policies around mental health. So, and I'd like the policies personally to be very simple and accessible so that young people can also read them as well and actually work in practice rather than just look really great and be put away somewhere. Um, I think, you know, embedding mental health across the curriculum, you know, when you're in English, talking about the mental health and the physical health of a character, for example, or, you know, the author or what they were thinking. I think, you know, I, I, can't, I can't sort of say anything without mentioning really technology. And we were having a conversation about this in preparing to come here. And I think it is interesting to me to see the rise of mental health issues uh, corresponding to the rise of technology. And I think we've got to ask ourselves some serious questions. And it might refer to the thing that I started actually the conversation about, is that the human brain is not really designed to process things so much. We need more rest and reflection. And maybe something like these smartphones are a saviour, but also a curse. So um, I think I could go on, but I know my time is almost up, so I'm going to pass over. Thank you so much. Thanks, Caroline. Um, that's been a really stimulating range of issues that you've raised there, um, both challenges for schools um, and indeed even in terms of ethos and ethics, I think, in education. Um, it also, of course, drives us to think about uh, evidence and the questions for many of you here today as educational researchers. I mean, uh, learning styles, for example, has been um, challenged, of course, by the evidence. Um, and of course, you've also raised the point about um, the, the, our brain's ability to deal with these different stimulus. Um, I think no one better, hopefully, to help us with some of those questions than Maritha. So next, thank you. Hello, good evening. Um, so I'm going to take quite a different sort of uh, perspective on this. Uh, so just to start thinking about children's mental health. Children's mental health does not develop in a vacuum. So we have the child, but we have all the systems around them. We have their family, school, wider society, community, and so on. 
And what we see from this, so for, let's take an example of, we have adult, we have lots of cohort studies here at IOE, and for example, we know from data from the mid-40s that today's adults in the mid-40s um, have much higher levels of mental health difficulties than adults a decade or so ago. And these adults are the parents of today's children, and we know that parents' mental health is an important thing for children's mental health. Similarly, let's think about schools. Teachers are under more pressure and stress, there's external metrics and all this pressure on them. And you can imagine that in a context of more pressured teachers or more stressed teachers, this passes on to children. So there's trickle-down effects from everything that happens in all these different systems to children's well-being. So in a time where real wages are not growing and income inequality is high, these stressors all contribute to the question of children's happiness. So we could mainly focus on the child and their immediate environment, but that would be missing the wider point, which is we need to think about the systems that we are creating that are making it harder for children to be well and happy in. So to promote children's well-being, we require the sort of political will and input, such as reducing inequalities, bringing in universal high-quality childcare, parental leave for both sexes, sufficient funding for schools, that let's call them big system changes um, that require political will and external sort of motivation to give more children a more equal start in life. So apart from these big system changes, we can think about the risk and protective factors in the environment that are important for children's mental health. So researchers in mental health for decades have studied risk factors for mental ill health. And these, you can imagine, constitute a range of things from children being maltreated and abused, deprivation, uh, parent separation or bereavement, and so on. And although it's very important to understand what the risk factors are for children's mental ill health and make all efforts we can to reduce them, it is probably unlikely that we will ever live in a world where no parents separate, no children are treated badly, and so on. So the other thing we don't do so much of in the mental health research world is think about protective factors. So what are the factors we can try and understand that might mitigate the impact of these risk factors in the development of mental health problems in children. So let's take an example. So we looked at this using data from a core study, and in the presence of risk factors, such as parent mental health problems and so on, um, in adolescents, the development of depressive symptoms was mitigated by protective factors such as we looked at a range of protective factors, but these included things like children feeling like there were social supports or support in the school system, um, family, good family climate or sort of family connectedness, self-efficacy. So there's things that we can identify that can mitigate risk that we can identify. So one thing to do would be to try and identify as many protective factors as we can and increase their density in the environment. So if we saturated the environment with protective factors, Presumably, we could try and mitigate the impact of the risk factors on children's well-being. The next thing I sort of want to focus on is to remind us of the title of today's debate, which was, what if we wanted our children to be happier? And the term we're using is happier. However, we know even less about children's happiness compared to what we know about their mental health problems. By this I mean decades of research on children's well-being is really decades of research on children's mental health difficulties. And it's important to remember that happiness and well-being are not the absence of difficulties. They're different and they're much, much more. We want children to flourish and we have barely examined what are the sorts of things that help them do that. And to try and rectify this as a researcher, recently a colleague and I looked at data from over 11,000 11 11-year-olds in the Millennium Cohort Study, which is a large national cohort study of children who were born at the start of this millennium. And we looked at both risk and protective factors of both mental ill health and well-being. And I saw some of you pick up this infographic on the way in, but if you want a summary of the study, it's, it's this infographic. Um, but essentially what we find is that children's mental health and well-being are not synonymous, so they're very poorly associated. And you can identify children who have who report quite good well-being or quality of life in the presence of quite high levels of symptoms, and the other way as well. So you have children who, although they don't have any mental health difficulties, are not reporting being happy or well either. And the 
Even more interesting thing was the sorts of things that were associated with more difficulties were not necessarily the same things that were associated with better well-being or worse well-being. So serving to highlight that we need to make more of an effort to understand what the things are that promote well-being as well as try and understand what are the risk and protective factors for mental health difficulties. So sort of to sort of end, my last thing is going to be to talk about the young person's perspective. So most research in child mental health is based on parent or teacher's reports of the child's mental health. And you might think this makes sense. Parents are the most common informant on young people's mm -hmm. mental health. Now think about what this actually means. All the research we have, or most of the research we have on children's mental health is based on somebody else's perspective. You might not think this is strange, but then try and remember when you were a teenager. Did your parents actually know anything about your internal mental states or emotions? Mine didn't, for sure. So if we, so the fact that parents and children, and this bears out in the data, parent reports and child reports of children's mental health barely agree. It's very, very poorly associated. And when you, and the argument for a long time has been, Oh, they're children, what do they know? But actually, when you ask a child, even as young as seven, and we've, we've done this, with, there's evidence of this, in age-appropriate manner about their mental health, they can tell you. I mean, even a five-year-old, if you ask them if they're feeling you know, sad or lonely, can tell you. So I think it's really important if we want to go ahead and understand what's sort of, what, what is triggering difficulties in young people, that we actually involve the young person's perspective more. And this applies to not just research, but also generally in talk, thinking about children's mental health. So for example, take today's panel. We could have had a few young people on the panel, and that would have been quite interesting. Um, so just in summary, we need to push for system changes that put more onus on children's well-being. Think not just about risk, but also about protective factors and increase their density in the environment. And not just difficulties, but also well-being. And while doing all of this with the young person's perspective front and center. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. That was a very helpful challenge in terms of perspectives <coughs> and um, a very useful takeaway that happiness isn't the absence of difficulties. And I guess there we're also touching on um, a concept that hasn't been mentioned yet, but which the education policy space is bombarded with, resilience. Uh, so turning now to you, Patrick. Okay. Um, so for me, I guess and all of us sit in the room, there's definitely um, an increased awareness around children and young people's mental health and the difficulties that children and young people are presenting and facing. Daily news, you pick up the newspaper, the weekend in particular, this weekend, lots and lots around children and young people's mental health difficulties. And I think it was interesting the way Becky started mentioning that it's one of the biggest potential crises, is the words we've heard used many, many times that the educational sector is facing today. For me, as a researcher at heart, it's quite difficult, and I agree with one of my um, esteemed colleagues here talking about it, is that the prevalence data that we've gotten that gets quoted very frequently is somewhat out of date. That one in 10 that you will have heard many, many times about your classroom is from mm -hmm. 2004. So it is out of date, and we do hope to have a new ONS study later this year. My experience, and the experience that we have in the 300 odd schools that we work with across the country, is that we are seeing more and more difficulties in schools, not just in whole number, but more so in the complexity of what we're seeing, the complexity of the cases that are in front of us in the classroom. And in the service that we provide at Place to Be, we're seeing a growing number of children who are presenting to us for emotional needs. So we do have a self-referral service um, within our schools where a child can fill in a slip and when I say child, I am referring, we work predominantly with primary schools. So 250 of our 300 schools are in the primary sector and 50 of which are in the sec in this secondary. And in that place to talk where somebody self-refers themselves, we know that 24% of the children who present to our service are presenting for emotional needs relating to sadness. And that number has increased from the previous academic year from 19%. So we are seeing a growing need. And if we look at in the counselling setting that we have with these children and young people, we ask them to set a goal. What is it that you want to achieve? To try and address that, giving the child a voice rather than a parent or a teacher is another common aspect of um, trying to assess a child. And we find that 18% of the children and young people who present to us, they actually say, they set their goal that they want to be happier at the end of the work that we do. And 16% set their goal to have fewer worries. 
So whilst we don't have huge amounts of up-to-date data, we are seeing year in, year out, we're a service that's been around for about 24 years now, similar data with a growing concern, particularly around happiness and worries. So our work and the wider research field demonstrates that early intervention is primarily the key for this. 50% of the adult uh, mental health difficulties that we see in the population manifest by the age of 14. So the earlier that we can get into the school setting and work with these children and young people, the more beneficial it will be. Now, I ask us as the adults, either as a teacher, an educator, a parent or a carer, some of the questions that we need to ask ourselves. And we need to think about as the adults, are we imposing or thinking about this world of perfectionism? Are we actually trying to place unrealistic, unrealistic expectations of our children and young people? The pressures to succeed today, you all, vast majority of you, of you, agreed that those pressures are much more than we faced when we were going through school or in our younger years. So are the pressures to succeed today a much taller order is something that I think we do need to stop and think about. The education sector gets such a bad name. There is no doubt about that when it comes to children and young people's mental health. And we need to think about why that is. Is it because our curriculums have become really narrow? Have they become too narrow? That we've become obsessed for lots of different reasons that are not just our own fault about achievement and thinking about the grades, the Ofsted inspection, being accountable for all of those different things. Is that the reason why our curriculums have become really narrow? Are we forgetting about the child that's in front of us? Are we forgetting about the whole child that's in front of us? Not just the grade that we want them to achieve, the value added that we can add to that child, but actually who they are as a person. Have we forgot as teachers that it's important for us to stop and think about how interesting is that child? What is it that they really, really like? For me, I went into teaching because I wanted to make a difference to children and young people. And I guess if we were to do that teacher thing of put up your hands if you agree, the vast majority of you would agree. But it's the time constraint that we've got within the school setting, one of the reasons why we don't have the time to actually take an interest in that child. And is that potentially having an impact? We're removing, for lots of reasons, funding being one, creativity, music, arts, drama, sports, from the school environment on a day-to-day -day basis. And we know that there is some research that demonstrates the impact, positive impact, that that can have on our own well-being as adults and as well for children and young people. And I think it's really important that we allow children and young people the opportunity to do things just because. Because they want to. Because they enjoy it. Because they love it. Not because they want to get the gold star. Not because they need to be in the A team or win the gold medal. But because they want to do it. We're not allowing some of our children and young people the opportunity to take risks because we, as the adults, potentially are worried about failure. We're worried about what it is a child might fail at without realizing that failing at something sometimes is the most important and valuable lesson that we could ever have. I was telling a colleague today that I was coming to speak about this and she added to what is happiness. She said, happiness is not the absence of difficulty as we've just heard but actually it's the survival of the knockbacks that we've had to get there. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Patrick. Again, challenging and thought-provoking stuff. Thank you. And we turn to Viv. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to begin actually by asking you to think about all the interactions that you have had today. And I'd like you to think about the greetings that you said to one another. And in doing so, I'd like you to compare how you greeted another person today with what I'm about to share with you. Recently, I was talking with a colleague about well-being, and Sam said to me, Viv, do you know this? That when the Maasai warriors of Kenya greet each other, they ask, how are the children? And why do they ask this? They ask this because for everyone, even those without children, the response that they are seeking is, all the children are well. This is because according to their social script, things can't be fully good for one individual or the community unless all the children are thriving. And this is certainly the case for schools and this is why I'd like to believe we are here today. We want our children to thrive. We want them to be happier, 
than statistics currently say they are. As a former head teacher, and now as a coach working extensively with heads and senior, senior leaders up and down the country, I have my own particular take on this, is, on this issue. If we want our children to be happier, if we want them to thrive, if we believe schools play a central role in this, then there are three key things that I believe we must attend to. The first is how we prepare our teachers for the classroom. I don't know how many of you here are familiar with the work of Parker Palmer. He's an American author and a Quaker activist and educator. And he says, good teaching cannot be reduced to technique. Good teaching comes from the identity and the integrity of the teacher. And I believe he is right. When teachers lose their vocational vitality, the whole system suffers and our children become unwitting victims. When teaching is reduced to technique and pro forma methods for raising achievement, something is lost. We lose passion, we lose authenticity, we lose the joy of teaching. And when teachers lose these things, our children, they lose out too. Teachers and children experience a diminished sense of self, identity and personal agency. To address this, we have to engage the souls of our teachers. We have to keep them engaged in a, cons in a constant conversation that keeps them connected back to their why. And we have to be deliberate in engaging them in CPD that probes their sense of purpose. Again, to quote Parker Palmer, no amount of CPD focused solely on technical proficiency will make any difference to teachers who are feeling stressed, isolated and disconnected from the profession. So we have to ensure that teachers are enabled to rediscover their joy and passion, because when that happens, our children will rediscover their joy and passion for learning too. One cannot be separated from the other. The second thing I think we need to address is the narrative that surrounds education today. Our children are caught up in the narrative of fear and competitiveness. And when such a narrative exists, it only perpetuates feelings of lack and self-worth by all who are in the system. It takes a great act of consciousness to step outside of these limiting ways of both thinking and feeling. It is my belief we would not have such a fixation on growth mindsets and the work of Carol Dweck and other related academics if this were not the case. All of us, whether we are parents, teachers, leaders, need to look at the role we can play in changing this narrative so that education is more concerned with the development of the whole person and the creation of a much fairer and happier society. And my third and final point that I think we need to address is how we attend to the professional needs of our school leaders. By professional needs, I don't mean how school leaders are supported with the strategic and operational demands of the role. They get plenty of that. I mean how they are supported to meet the needs of themselves, the person in the role. To me, it seems that we tend to encourage our school leaders to wear busyness as a badge of honour, paying little attention to the impact that this has upon the well-being and, well and the well-being of our children. We like to theorise about the benefits of emotional intelligence, yet we show little commitment to using this knowledge to transform the way heads and school leaders lead themselves and lead their schools. It wasn't until early on in my headship when I found myself sobbing in my car one night that I was forced to stop and look at the role and how it was impacting on my well-being and the very minimal support that I was getting for myself, the person in the role. And I now know from the work I do today that far too many heads have had moments just like myself when they have cried alone. Just as with our teachers, 
it is a nonsense to think that our children will not be affected by the mental health of their head teachers. They will be. Heads set the weather in their schools. It stands to reason that heads who are better supported to cope with the demands of the role will be better at creating climates in their schools in which everyone thrives, including our children. So the system must ensure, just as is, as is the case in other helping professions, that on appointment, heads are provided with some type of ongoing personalized support to safeguard both their mental health and that of our children. And I'll end with Albert Einstein's famous words, no problem can be solved by the same level of consciousness that caused it in the first place. We have to be prepared to raise our level of consciousness and understanding about this issue. We have to be prepared to take on different ideas and different viewpoints about the well-being crisis facing our schools and our children. And perhaps, if we can all agree that our shared humanity is what binds us all together, then perhaps, just perhaps, we might be well on our way to finding a solution. Thanks, Viv. What a brilliant provocation and, and bringing it back, of course, to um, both teachers and school leaders, uh, their roles and also, of course, their own mental health and well-being. Um, let's take a moment because I think that's been um, a brilliant stimulation for us just to thank our speakers, first of all, before we get to the debate. So we've got, um, we've heard the evidence that happiness and mental health aren't the same thing, and that's a very uh, useful delineation, I think. We've heard that mental ill health is on the increase um, among young people. And we've heard, of course, a whole range of different uh, explanations or potential explanations for this in, in terms of what people have said. And that's also been shared by colleagues feeding in on Twitter, uh, where, for example, uh, comments include um, a suggestion, homelessness, neglect, abuse. Um, actually, we didn't hear all that much uh, from panelists in terms of, you know, um, the social context outside schools that teachers are having to address, uh, not least, of course, the local authority funding crisis. Um, and we know how that is ramping up the situation uh, within schools that teachers have to face every day. Um, another comment from uh, Twitter. We certainly think that screen time isn't helping. So building on some of Caroline's comments there. Um, another one, lack of socialization leading to poor behavior. And we have a comment here, inadequate training from experts for teaching staff who aren't specialists or experts in behavior, least of all, least of all send, and this entrenches many, many issues. Um, there are also a few comments picking up um, points made by Viv about teacher mental health being really important issue and under strain here, including the comment, teachers exhausted through working for the promotion of others. So we've got this raft of different potential explanations. And what I'm really interested in with, with my first uh, question, perhaps pri primarily to Pravitha and Patrick, um, is we, we, we have all this, the, these different explanations. There's been suggestions uh, uh, from the majority of panelists that this is actually connected to the type of schooling <coughs> and provision. But what evidence do we have for that? Patrick, I can start Thank with you. you. Oh, thanks. Thanks for that one. <laughs> <laughs> the, I think we've got to be realistic about this, that the evidence is sparse. Um, especially with the question that you've just posed in particular. Um, even if we think about the numbers, the, the prevalence data that we've got is so out of date. And we've seen some new stuff with the Millennium Cohort Study recently, but we don't actually have the real prevalence, pre prevalence data that we'd like to have. So I'm going to dodge your question by going around it a little bit and really think about, well, it is a complex issue. 
It's complex because of the protective factors that you've just talked about, the negative factors that we've just heard about, and the comments that you've just mentioned from, from Twitter as well. It's not as straightforward as this is the reason why we are seeing these potential increases. Um, you know, I went to a talk recently by an esteemed professor in, in psychiatry, and he, he was very clear that he doesn't believe that we are seeing these significant increases in mental health, psychiatric mental health difficulties being diagnosed. Um, and he was very clear that th that graph that we all expect to see is not there. So I'm really reluctant to comment mm -hmm. until I've got hard data, but mm -hmm. you might have something else that you want to add. So um, as somebody who's not... Um sort of, who doesn't prescribe by the DSM, so the diagnostic manual necessarily being correct or working, and thinking of mental health as being on a spectrum, I think it's important to think about the spectrum. Um, so yes, the sort of national diagnostic data that we'd like is probably coming out later this year, but in th terms of thinking about the spectrum, uh, we mentioned the Millennium Cause study earlier, which um, a couple of years ago there were 14, 15. And we have a measure of depressive symptoms in this um, study. And 10 years ago, we had the same measure of depressive symptoms in another cohort. And what we see is actually, if you just look at this measure of depressive symptoms, um, the proportion, both the sort of overall average scores, so the whole distribution, is more shifted to the right. So there's higher problems across the board. And this is reflected in the people above the cu clinical cutoff. So in the Millennium Cohort study, the recently published numbers were 24% of girls and 9% of boys. So one in four girls and one in 10 boys almost um, were suffering from high levels of depressive symptoms above a clinical threshold. And 10 years ago, this was 12% of girls and 5% of boys. So in 10 years, just 10 years, on the same measure and the same cutoff, we see there's an increase. And this may not um, sort of be the same as getting mental health diagnosis, but if it impacts on the child's life um, and has consequences for their functioning, I still think it's important um, whether they're diagnosed or not. Um, and the other point is about other things like self-harm. So we also have, comparing the same two cohorts, the self-harming is um, increased. And this is, bears out in NHS data. So it's possible, again, that diagnosis is not going up. But if more children are self-harming, I would worry. Um. Thank you very much. And it's lovely to hear the uh, Millennium Cohort Studies being mentioned all the time, because, of course, we proudly host them here at the IOE. You have to get that plug in. <laughs> um, and, and thinking, uh, Viv and Caroline, again, um, when we hear this discussed on the media, uh, there tends to be a great deal of attention to the issue of social media and the potential role that plays. In your practitioner work, is that a big challenge for young people and, um, and also for schools to deal with? Uh, or, or do you think that this is actually just overhyped? No, I actually think, obviously, I do a lot of work with school leaders. And from what I know, when I'm in the private space with head teachers, what I'm told is the impact that, that social media has on the young people in their school and the issues that they are then having to deal with that heaps on then the, the children, their families, the teachers, and I think someone else said, you know, the head teachers, it works all the way up. So, yes, social media really is an, a factor in all of this, from my experience. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, would, I would agree. I think, um, I think social media is quite addictive. Um, even as adults, we, we might find ourselves checking it out and literally you can while away an hour or however long just by looking at other people's stuff. And, and I'm thinking, you know, if you're not in a very good space uh, and if you think about naturally, you know, growing up as being a young person... All you want to do is fit in. You want to be like everybody else. So, you know, if you're... It's that fear of missing out. You know, if, you, if there's a party going on and everybody you know is going to that party and it's all over the social media and you're not invited, it's in your face, isn't it? So there's, there's that angle. It is very addictive. Um, you know, my 15-year-old son is constantly looking at his phone, constantly. And then the other... 13 year old is playing video games so and you talk to most parents actually there are big arguments going on um, trying to 
you know, trying to maintain control, actually, of, of social media. Now, social media is also a very protective factor. It's really important that we don't bash technology because, you know, they're also really good connectors to people. So if you're feeling quite isolated, you know, you can connect with other people through this medium. So um, I, I just think it needs to be managed. That, that is my view. I think we need boundaries around it. And there's a, a really great organisation called Shine Offline. And their job is to go around and basically teach us all how to manage technology. And really simple things like not using your phone as your alarm clock. You know, buying an alarm clock. You know, putting your mobile phone somewhere else just so that you've got that space outside of where you sleep. I think it's really important because there's all sorts of issues, I think, around sleep hygiene. You know, which is a funny word of talking about. <laughs> how we all settle down in the evening. But if you're, you know, constantly checking your phone and constantly on social media, it's going to impact on how you start to relax your brain as well. Thank you. Um, OK, well, let's turn to you, the audience, now. Um, we'll have our usual round of questions. And if you could please introduce yourselves uh, before you speak and also keep your questions short and succinct, we'll have more time for them. Uh, so a show of hands, please. Anyone with questions? A lady here and the lady in green at the front. Hi, my name's Isabella. I'm an impact manager at Impetus PEF. Um, my question is, what works? What have we found that works? I think a few of you alluded to it. I'd love to hear that expanded upon. Thank you very much. And another question just here. Hi, my name is Rashmi. Uh, I'm a student here at IOE. My question is to Patrick. He said that uh, the reason we have uh, so many issues is because we have less time. Our less time has led to the ignorance of the children. How do we make more time then? We have a curriculum, we have a year, we have grades to go up to. How do we make more time then? Thank you very much. One more in this round? One more hand. Okay, well, let's start with our response first then. Um, so first of all, um, we've got this uh, question from Isabel, what works? Uh, we've, we've begun on this, but I think you're absolutely right. We need to drill in <laughs> for Ether. I'm not sure I should be the first person to take this one. <laughs> Come on. on. If you were to, to think of sort of one uh, area that we should be focusing on, do you think? Well, when you say what works, it's difficult to know whether you mean in terms of like intervention or just in terms of how things sort of are running, I guess. So you have the sort of evidence for in terms of sort of comprehensive education, school systems are think more about children, which tend to come from other countries. For example, Finland is an example often cited. And then you have the other side, which is actually focused school-based mental health interventions. And there's so many interventions with their manuals and everything. And you know, there's evidence, there's mixed evidence. There's also different quality of evidence for which ones work and don't work. So I think the what works in terms of the interventions will need a real sit down and going through lots of different papers. Um, but there are lots of systematic reviews out there about what, how different interventions work or different types of interventions work. So I guess that's, sort of, that's my start. Thank, thank you. And um, Patrick, obviously, place to be is looking at some of this. Yeah, so from a, a what works point of view, it, I agree, it's quite difficult to think what is it we're actually looking at. Um, my experience, um, and actually this, if I can, jumps into the second question a little bit as well about how do we make um, more time. I think one of the things that I'd be interested in looking at is we need this to start at the... At well, there's a societal issue that needs to be looked at. There's an education sector issue that needs to be looked at. These are very big, big questions. But if we think about the school, let's think about the school that you potentially might be working in or working with. It needs to start at the top. You need to have your management who actually see the value in putting a positive spin on mental health and well-being, putting that at the core of what the decision-making process you were having within the school itself. 
understanding that um, well-being is an important component. Uh, somebody earlier talked about how it should be enshrined in, 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 in the curriculum in different aspects, but actually just stopping and thinking about the well-being of a child rather than just the processes that need to be followed, the systems that need to be followed to get the grades, to meet the boundaries for the inspectors, for the governors, whatever it might be. But starting at the top and having that buy-in. Um, Caroline mentioned, I think, earlier about having a mental health policy or a well-being policy within schools. Um, some of the schools we go out and work with, it's quite interesting to find that lots of schools still have in place that. I'm not saying you should go and write a brand new well-being policy. You've got all of these things there in some different guise, in your behavioural policy, your attendance policy, your anti-bullying policy, but it's how do you bring all of these things together so that the ethos of your school is actually thinking about the well-being of not just the children. And I think that's where we fall down so many times when we talk about mental health. We just talk about the children. Mm -hmm. Place to be, we take a real whole school approach. And by whole school, I'm not just talking about the child or the young person in front of you. It has to involve the governors. It has to involve the management. It has to involve the teachers, the non-teaching staff. The non-teaching staff within our schools are actually sometimes the first eyes on some of the difficulties that we see. And they are the first port of call for so many particularly younger children who want to go to the receptionist or to the librarian and will say what it is that's bothering them. And they pick up on these things. And we sometimes forget about that non-teaching staff. Parents and carers, we need to be doing more with our parents and carers as well. Because you only have, we only have in our schools children for X number of hours a day. And we can do all of these great interventions that have been evidence-based and have been this and that, but if a child's gone home and facing significant difficulties at home or a lack of understanding sometimes, how do we work with parents in a positive spin? So I think it's how do we get a whole school approach where you get buy-in from all different levels? And I hope that will help a little bit with the time question that you've asked as well. <laughs> Thank you. And Viv, from a sort of practitioner perspective, what do you think works in schools? Well, to be honest, I'd really just echo exactly what Patrick has said, and I don't know if this has been a bit cheeky, but I know there's someone here in the audience who's, really, who's done exactly what Patrick has, has spoken about, has led from the top, has developed well-being in their school, and I don't know if we're allowed to sort of put that out to the audience, to invite that person who is here to share that. <laughs> <laughs> You're but I think you're welcome to stand up and wave, and people can perhaps talk to you afterwards. <laughs> Congrat congratulations on the work you're doing. Thank you. I'm Alison Creel, and I was the head teacher of a primary school in Hackney called Northwell Primary School, and I'm now the CEO of the Amaya Trust. Um, but I do that on a part-time basis. Um, but we put well-being um, as our first priority in the school um, and that meant that we looked at what that meant for staff and for the children um, and I absolutely know that when you start um, placing priority on the well-being of the team around you it's amazing how that then impacts on the children. So that was the first thing that we did. Um, the other thing that we did in terms of the curriculum, um, we tried not to place an emphasis on maths, English and science being the best subject. Because when you, when you say that is the biggest priority in the school day, then for the children who are great at English, maths and science, their self-esteem goes up. But for the children who are great at other things, they then feel that they're not clever, they're not good enough. They then start chasing things that isn't meant to be for them. So we try to spend uh, our time helping the children to know what they were good at and then promoting that so that once children began to feel good about themselves, they did take risks. And we found that by working in that kind of way, um, our results automatically took care of themselves. The less English, maths and science we did, and the more emphasis we placed on a wider curriculum where children felt good about themselves, the results took care of themselves. And we stopped kind of chasing that rainbow. Thank you very much okay. for that input. That's really interesting. And then just turning to you, Caroline, then, um, how about this issue about um, kids these days having less time? Is, is that something that, um, that resonates with you? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, my children are 
all of them, I mean, the 15-year-olds in year 11, and he's got an after-school catch-up every single day. So not only is he starting school at... Um, he starts school at nine, he finishes at four, and he's then also then doing an hour, an hour and a half of further studying in preparation for year 11 and then he's then got to drive home so by the time he gets home we pick him up he's probably going to be home about six and then you're thinking well the average teenager needs quite a lot of sleep so you need to make sure so you've got like a window every day of just a a couple of hours and and I just think to myself you know like this is it is it right that we should be putting all this homework on these young people with we've got them all day they're absolutely exhausted by the time they've come back, but then they've got more work to do as well. And uh, it goes back to this rest and reflection time. And then, of course, when I talk to my friends, you know, they've got various different clubs sorted out as well. So they're, they're in various different clubs at different days of the week. And, and actually, and then they've got tutors because you've also then got to make sure that they can pass all of the exams even more so. So mm. actually, the window that young people have of time gets gets smaller and smaller and their choice of what they want to do and then you've got the parents and the caregivers running around complaining that they're really stressed and not got a lot of time um i just think we've probably just got to think less is more you know we you know less is more and the most precious thing we've got is time and how do we utilize that to the best of our abilities and and do what we want to do and what we know is good for us rather than the things that we should do or expected to do. Thank you very much. And this is this conversation seems to me to be very very wide ranging. It's wonderful to hear uh, the practitioner input and the thoughtful stimulations as well about the curriculum, about pressures in school and so on. Um, but I'm I'm really struck by the fact that these pressures appear to be um, impacting not just on on low attainers or indeed on kids from working class backgrounds, but on uh, middle class kids um, and high attainers from 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 whatever background as well. There seem to be the complexity at stake here seems to be quite unprecedented. I think, um, and I'm really mindful that um, we seem to have this real array of potential explanations, um, but the research not yet able to delineate uh, which are more important um, of the extent of change in each. So actually for us as a sort of re re um, education research forum, um, a real stimulation, I think, and provocation for us to be thinking more about the research here. Let's please have another round of questions because we've got so many issues that are coming to the fore here. There's a lady here um, and a gentleman here at the front. Hi, uh, my name's Holly Rigby. I'm a secondary school uh, English teacher. Um, and I think that what's really interesting, I think that lots of schools are now doing lots of things around wellbeing, both for teachers and for students. And I think you would always want to work in a school that is trying to make the environment as kind of um, good for people's wellbeing as possible. You know, wellbeing rooms and wellbeing week and all these different initiatives. Um, but my concern is that Basically, it's, it's just helping individuals to manage a deeply unequal and unfair world. And, 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 and it's not getting to the root of the issue. And we do have evidence for that. Um, the Spirit Level um, is a fantastic book. And the authors show the direct correlation between inequality, income, in, you know, inequality in income and, and mental health issues. Um, you know, we don't have evidence about what works. We just know that less, uh, I mean, more equal societies have a better standard of living than that impacts on their on their well-being so do you think that we need to be trying thinking less about what works and evidence-based strategies and thinking more about well actually we just need to redistribute um wealth in our society and we might have a happier society thank you for that excellent question and then there's a gentleman at the front here okay. uh, my name is gonzaga uh, i'm just a good neighbor uh, so my question is uh, is simple. So, is there any a guideline or a training for a support system as parents, friends, guardian, neighbor that actually react with a variety of a mental state like sadness, anxiety, or any other uh, mental state? Because I think, in my opinion, uh, we just cannot 
focus on your happiness or make people just happier because I think other a variety of a mental state is very important as well. So we need to deal with all of those uh, so we can be healthy as a person and life being. Thank you very much. So actually two questions there, um, both around social context. Um, the first about social inequality and this potentially um, explaining uh, 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 mental ill health here and, and unhappiness. And the second about um, friendship networks and um, the, the infrastructure, I suppose, or, or relationships around individuals. Um, so anyone particularly on social inequality? Yeah, well, yeah, it's a no-brainer, that one. Um, <laughs> I think... Is this working? Can you hear me? I think uh, how do you... You, you can't create uh, happiness when the society around you is, is unhappy. You know, it's impossible, really. Even with the best will in the world, even if you put all the protective factors in it, there are fundamental challenges. Um, you know, it's really difficult, it's really expensive to live in this country at the moment. You know, rent is really high. You know, just doing some of the basic things are, are really difficult. Everywhere you look, you've got really clever, sophisticated adverts, marketing, telling us all, we need this. You know, you're a whole person, you're a beautiful person if you've got this. This is going to complete you. Um, and if you haven't got the means with which to access a lot of that, and you haven't... I mean, I, I walk I walk past... We, we've got an office in... Mental Health First Day has got an office in Old Street. And I walk past this, this one man on the street every day. And he's living in the phone box, literally, as you come out of the station in Old Street. If any of you know Old Street, he's there. And each time I see him, I make a promise to myself that I'm going to do something... I'm going to do something. And I think for Mental Health First Aid, one of the things that we're really particularly interested in at the moment is around helping the community more. So because we're a community interest company, we want to utilise the money that we make through Mental Health First Aid training and redistribute that into helping support people with mental health um, issues. And, and the focus for us is around uh, socially marginalised communities because we've, we've done some research with our um, instructors and our board and our central team. And ev one of the things that unites everybody is that we want to do more with, with social inequality and uh, people that generally are, are socially marginalised. So I think, but we, dare I say it, that is not a priority in this current state of the world, is it really? If you think about the political state that we're in, um, I don't think that it's a priority. <laughs> Thank you. Viv? Yeah. I think the point that you made was really, really important in terms of what's happening in our schools because we know that the government has one take on well-being and we know, in a sense, the route that it's trying to sort of perpetuate or popularise in schools. But I think the point that you made there is so key. Schools are part of communities. You know exactly, you know the stories of the children who are coming into your school day in and day out. You know the realities of what life is about for them. And I think if we really want to make a difference here, then I think we do need to be looking at well-being as being part of the bigger picture. We have to have the conversations, as difficult as they might be, about the realities of our children's lives and what schools are prepared to do to really stay connected to the communities. And I know that's hard. I know with LA cuts and public sector cuts and more and more has been put on schools to take over services that, that once would have been provided by social services. But it's key. You know it's key. You wouldn't have put the question forward if you didn't realise just how important it was and recognise that actually well-being can be quite superficial sometimes and there's a much deeper level that we need to go to to really make a difference. So I'm in total agreement and you just need to open the conversations in school and really have them with the people who need to have those, you have those conversations with. Thank you both. Um, I won't say... I completely agree with your point, but I started with that, so we have to you know, think about the big system changes. I mean, not just income inequality, I think we have a big problem with generational inequality in this country, and obviously I'd say that as a young adult, but you know, I think it's a problem. But I just wanted to add a really sort of small, interesting 
tidbit from our research um, that I think speaks to this question quite interestingly. So in the Millennium Cohort Study, at age 11, we asked children, compared to most of your peers, do you feel richer, poorer, or the same? And controlling for the actual family income and lots of other variables, this, so when children said they felt richer or poorer rather than the same as most of their peers, they had lower well-being, controlling for actual household income. I think that's really, I mean, we know this from adult research, that inequality, but not just actual inequality, also perceived inequality is associated with well-being. But it's really interesting to already see this in children at age 11. And I think, I mean, it's quite striking that that is the case. Um, I, so I just wanted to sort of add that. Thanks, Anything to add, Patrick, maybe on friendships? Or? Um, uh, no. Listen, we all agree. There's no doubt about that. Um, and if I had that magic wand, uh, I know what I'd be spending and you know, trying to, get to do with it. But uh, I think one thing that just stands out in my mind that it's kind of something I think we need to just get, to get straight is this whole idea about mental health and a spectrum of mental ill health. And I think we've got, and you, you touched on it a little bit earlier, and I think it falls into this category when somebody mentioned about happiness earlier as well. It's that you know, we are, we, we do, mental health is on a spectrum and lots of us will have good days and bad days. And I think young people especially, um, I, I remember this specific story in one of the schools that I worked in where um, one of the head teachers, senior leaders came to me and said, I'm really, really worried because I think this group of year 12s are really stressed. They're really stressed to the point that I'm exceptionally worried. So I was tasked to go and observe some of the lessons and follow this class around. It was a maths class. And um, so I went and I observed some of the lessons and yeah, they, they seemed you know, like year 12s would with studying maths, that was fine. And when I started to speak to the, the students in the class, it transpired that there was a deadline coming up. There was a deadline on the Tuesday for their coursework piece that they had to submit. So they were feeling, in their words, really stressed about that deadline. And then when we spoke a little bit more, it transpired that one of the kids in the class was having a significant party on the Saturday night <laughs> and they were really stressed because they realized that they couldn't get to the party because they had the coursework to do for the Tuesday. So when we started to talk about it and we were really thinking what it is you mean, it turns out that we as the adults and society need to be careful about the language that we're using as well. They didn't mean that they were stressed from a clinical point of view. They meant that they were having to do a little bit more work than they had planned to do, and they were really annoyed because it got in the way and they weren't going to be able to go to the party the weekend because they didn't plan their time properly, which we're all guilty of. So it's just been very, very mindful when we talk about these things, particularly with big societal things as well. We've got to be very mindful of the fact that one, mental health affects all of us. There is nobody in this room that doesn't have mental health. We've got to think about mental health and mental ill health, but also the language that we use around depressed, stressed, anxious. I, we just need to be very mindful of those. And back to the very first question they were asked in this section, the, the schools that we work in, uh, with Place to Be, they are in, there's no doubt about that. You will not be surprised by the number of children we see who have special educational needs or disabilities, who are on looked after plans, who are cared for children, are significantly higher, and I mean three to four times higher than the national population. Mm -hmm. And they are the children that we're seeing for one-to-one -one in therapeutic care. Thanks, Patrick. Well, I've got a couple of um, more comments from um, the Twitter sphere. Um, Parent Engage says, being allowed phones in their bedrooms at night, lack of quality time spent with parents, poor digital diet with often unfettered access to harmful sites and content. So that's very much a focus on social media again. And then Alison Creel says, we need to think about the systems we're creating to make children unwell. Big system changes are needed and protective factors. So I guess that speaks to some of the earlier points. And of course, we also did a Twitter poll at the beginning of this session. The question put uh, to the audience was, what do you feel is causing the most harm to young people's well-being? Uh, and the options were social media, high-stakes testing, and economic insecurities, 
And uh, actually, the biggest share of the woke vote went to social media, with 50% of uh, Twitter respondents uh, voting for social media, and then um, a quarter of the vote each equally shared between high-stakes testing and economic uh, insecurities. So, so that's the view of the wider audience. Um, we probably just have time for just a very a couple of very short questions if anyone has any burning issues. We've got two... Oh, grr, help. They've got to be really, really short then uh, and really, really quick. Two here and, and two here. Thanks. Hi, I'm Yasmin. Um, I'm studying um, education studies here at IOE um, and I had a really important question. So you mentioned about high-stake testing. Um, I had the question of to what extent would the panellists agree or disagree that the mental health and well-being of both teachers and students are sort of considered as collateral damage um, in the pursuit of trying to achieve, you know, these high grades, etc. Thank you very much. And the lady next to you. Um, so I'm Evelyn. I was a teacher and now work for education charity. Um, my question is based on a more unpopular topic because, Patrick, you mentioned earlier about things like drama, music, and, you know, creative things in school helping with well-being. Um, where do you, or yourself and Prefita, stand with religious studies within schools? Because now that's a subject that's kind of often been taken off the curriculum. And also going back to back in the 80s, um, when the workday was pretty much Monday to Saturday and whole family, most people were off on Sunday. How do you think that plays in terms of research and well-being now? Thank you very much. And Hi, I'm Tanvi. I'm a student here at the IOE. Uh, my question is that mental well-being is still a stigma and with teachers working directly with children and if a teacher openly talks about uh, mental health issues, would it affect her credibility and employability? What is your uh, idea on that? Thank you very much. And I think we have one last one here. Thanks, Kate. Can you see the hand? Thanks. Hi. Um, I just wanted to put to the panel about um, looking at, which we mentioned briefly about marginalised groups within society, and there hasn't really been any discussion around race or um, and how that kind of plays into it, because as we, we see in exclusion rates, it uh, significantly impacts uh, uh, people from BME backgrounds, particularly young black boys um, who are being excluded at a far higher rate um, and how that comes into the mental health conversation and how we can culturally kind of move to meet different different children because they there is such a difference between Thanks so much thank you those are great questions and coming in in a very short time so we need very very short answers and i think just one each to each of the questions who would like to answer on high stakes testing I'll answer on that. <laughs> Go on, Liv. I have to, I'm sorry to have to say this, but I am in agreement with you. We wouldn't be in this place now. You wouldn't be asking that question if it wasn't evident from the number of teachers who are leaving the profession, the number of people who don't want to step up to headship or school leadership, because we lack the vocabulary and the understanding to really have a humane approach to how we take care of our teachers and school leaders' mental health. And as long as academic standards and league tables are the measure by which we, we assess success, then mental health will always be collateral damage. Breaks my heart to say that, but the statistics, I think, speak for themselves. Thank you. Patrick, stigma or curriculum? Uh, stigma. Let's, let's go with stigma. Um, I think you're absolutely right. There is still a stigma around mental health and having an open discussion about it uh, tonight. Thank you we are having that. Um, we've, we've come a long way. Uh, campaigns like the Heads Together campaign, I think, has really helped us with that. Um, for a teacher, talking about it in their school, I think, was partly the question. Let's remember what we're talking about here. We're talking about somebody's health. So I would say that for that teacher, if you are that person who wants to disclose it, thinking about who you're disclosing it to, do you have a safety network within the school that you feel supported that if you were to disclose it? Remember as well that there are certain elements of this that is um, part could be seen as discriminatory if somebody was making a discriminatory case against progression or your job because of your mental health. It is part of your health in the same way that they wouldn't be able to do so about you being disabled with physical disability. But I think more importantly, that bit aside, 
in a school environment, if you are feeling that your mental health is struggling at some point, do you have that support network within the school? Is there a mentor within the school that you've got? Is there a counsellor within the school who's available to you? Or have you got support networks outside that you're able to access? Thank you. Sorry, I'm, and, not, I'm and not sure which one whether, to go whether with. Whether you want to go okay. for BME or um, back to one of the others. Okay, um, I will. I will try. Um, so, in terms of um, ethnic minorities, um, I think it's probably important to try and understand different cultural contexts. Um, it's. And there is some interesting evidence. We just have a paper looking at referral to CAM services from schools. And for example, it's quite interesting how different ethnic groups, where their referral routes are. So for example, we find that um, with sort of white British children, it's more likely to be primary care or self-referred, whereas with um, ethnic minority children, it's more likely to be social services or um, youth justice. So it, they tend to be more compulsory routes rather than voluntary routes. Um, so it's quite interesting, I think, to understand sort of um, but also different stigma associated with mental health in different um, cultural communities. Um, for example, I'm South, East, South Asian, and um, I know that in the British Indian community, mental health has a probably higher stigma associated with it than some other communities. Um, so, yeah, so I would probably say we need to understand more and remember the child's context and their wider family context when we think about some of these things. Thank you very much. And Caroline, did you want to say anything about the curriculum? I know you may not be a sort of have a specialism in RE, but um, I don't actually have a specialism in the curriculum. Um, I do think that you know, obviously, the curriculum has been squeezed, and um, uh, things like you know RE. Think we, you know, Patrick was talking about it. Things like art, music, even PE. Everything's been squeezed down, and and the focus has purely been on. Um, on, on those what, what's deemed to be the most important subjects. Um, I, I think, I mean, I'm not an expert on RRE at all. I mean, you're talking to somebody who um, comes from, you know, my family are two different religions and uh, we grew up in a, in a religion-free household. Um, so religion is definitely not my area of experience, but for me, I'm a very spiritual person. Um, and I think it's really important to have that element of spirituality in, in education. It's really important. But what I would like to just finish off with, with my key point here, is I think one of the things I'd like to say is that listening to our young people, our children, is probably the most important thing that we can do. Um, listening to each other, listening to our parents. And um, a lot of the conversations today have been about relationship and talking to, to the young people uh, as if, as like you would like to have been talked to at that age. And, um, you know, and, and, you know, seeing parents as, as a support um, and listening to parents' concern as well, rather than seeing them as, as maybe undoing some of the work that we'd like to happen. Thanks so much, Caroline. Well, that's been really thought-provoking, I think. Um, I know that there'll be lots of conversations on the way home about this and maybe on the social media afterwards. Don't damage your mental health, of course. <laughs> um, but thanks so much for your brilliant questions, audience. And thanks so much to our panellists for that really enriching discussion. Let's give them a round of applause.